So let's hold it like this so we can have questions and comments. Thank you all. Oh, please say your name and who you're directing your question to. Oh, my name is Leo Kutlev. Uh, you're still in Edinburgh. Well, my, my question is to Natalie. Um, Frank, I understand the logic of this uh, statute you mentioned to us, mm -hmm. this American statute, as regards the jurisdiction of the cases you described. So, there was allegedly American support to those authoritarian <coughs> regimes. That's why allegedly American federal courts could hear those tort cases between the agreed parties and their dictators. I understand the jurisdictional issues here. What I don't understand is why uh, the issue of applicable law. As I understand, as was implied in your presentation, as I understood, uh, they, they applied pretty much American law of negligence, whatever, of tort. And I don't understand why, considering both the party to you know, relationship mm -hmm. to the obligation to, uh, to, to the tort, to the lawsuit, were foreigners, so from the point of view of conflict with of laws, mm -hmm. why wasn't it the law of the relevant country? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so the question, uh, am I holding this okay? Yeah. The question of applicable law under the Alien Tort Statute is a bit com complicated. I'll just, to, to outline it, it's, it's not accurate to say that they um, applied uh, American tort law, and I should have been clearer maybe in the way I, I spoke, the, um, when you sue under the alien tort statute, you have to invoke a, a violation of a norm of international law, either a violation of a treaty or of customary international law. The doctrine of command responsibility that was the, the main, you know, the, well, the, the violation was the violation of the prohibition against torture, disappearance, and, um, and extrajudicial uh, execution. Those were the three violations that were invoked, and the doctrine of command responsibility is a doctrine of international law. This was first developed at Nuremberg and Tokyo. Um, so that's in international law. Now, in, in questions of procedure, you know, the fact that you can you can have a class action. Um, I guess that's part of the American tort system, and so. But you know, all the, this is happening in a U.S. court, so questions of procedure are resolved. Um, in addition, uh, international law, you know, it's it doesn't have the I would say expertise to deal with this kind of case where you have to go into detail, prove causation, things like that. So very, the courts resort to domestic law. Um, they look to, and you know, also to calculate damages uh, for torture, for example. So they, they look to the domestic law of many countries, whatever relevant countries they see fit, and they do sort of a mi mishmash. They, there have been analyses of this. Basically, they take whatever law is is more favorable to the plaintiffs. So that's a whole other mess. But those are only for questions of detail. The the applicable law is international law, and that's what, in the view of uh, advocates of alien tort statute litigation of, of universal jurisdiction, gives it its legitimacy. They say, we're, this is not American imperialism. We're, we're only enforcing uh, universally agreed norms, and it can't just be any violation of international law. It's, it was, even before Kill Bill, it was restricted to, you know, things like torture, slavery, genocide, that, in theory, you're not supposed to disagree with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question to, to Andrea. Um, maybe a suggestion. I think it could be very interesting, maybe, to make a confrontation about this problem with the legislation, with the statutes of, of mines uh, of Kutna Hora in Bohemia, in now in Czech Republic. Um, we have a similar situation, we had a similar situation also in, in, in the region of Transylvania, you know. Uh, but there the Saxons were many and very, very powerful. So I think, I think it was really another situation. 
but maybe the situation of Kutnaura could be interesting to make uh, a confrontation with. Uh, and I explain why. Um, the, mine, the mine code of Stefan Lazarevich is appear at the last period of the, the Serbian state, because I think not so many years before the, the arrival of the Ottoman. 50 not, years, something. Yeah, but it is not the period, for example, of, uh, of, the, of the empire, the moment of the, the, the power of the, of the Serbian state. It's like the agony of the Serbian state during Stefan Lazarevich. And this is interesting because the mind code of Kutnaora appears, I think, during, during a, a period of great power of the king. I think it was Charles IV, I think. So it, it could be very interesting to understand if this kind of situation uh, could depend uh, from also from the cent of the powerful of the central power. For example, and I say this because, of course, yeah, we, we're speaking we're speaking about the, the the courts about Saxon, not about mining code, okay? But the arguments are connected, and I, I, I say this because, for example, in Roman law, um, many scholars have studied the problem of mining. For example, for Romania, for Dacia, and so on, the, the river, a river of gold there were in Dacia, river of gold, wars was, were made to take Dacia for the gold. And um, every time, this is very interesting, because every time the, the, the problem of mine, of mines in, in, Ro in Roman law uh, concerned concern the state, and, and the property of, the, of, of mines were in the hands of the state, the emperor of the republic of the emperor but of the state so uh, what, what I would like to say that um, the, 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 the organization of the work into the mines was hard was necessary to call something someone from outside the Saxon in this case and for this reason for this reason all this structure also in also the legal structure was in the hands of the of the power of the central power so this could be a how can i say a key or lack of lecture of these problems, these kind of problems. thank you know. yeah. well thank you for your contribution use uh, regale montanorum that um, code issued for for kutna hora uh, it's, it's issued one century before the code of despot Stefan Lazarevich, it's true. But, uh, firstly, you have to know that uh, Serbia at the time of despot Stefan was very centralized. Actually, it wasn't a feudal uh, monarchy, feudal state in the true West European sense. It was much more a uh, monarchy of the type of Louis XIV than a uh, feudal state with uh, landlords, nobility, and, and etc. And um, that level on, of centralization at the time of the despot Stefan was highest in the whole Serbian medieval history or in the whole history of Serbian medieval state. At the same time, one should, one should say and notice that Despot Stefan was very powerful. That uh, part of his rule was not an agony of Serbian state. Maybe it wasn't, the state wasn't at let's say, territorial uh, peak point at that time, but it was very, very rich. And you can see that that state was very rich um, because of the monasteries and fortresses that were built at that time. So only one rich state could build Smederevo and Belgrade and Manasia, etc. And telling story about the empire and about uh, emperor 
Dusan, Tsar Dusan, at that time, uh, Serbian state wasn't centralized at all. So central power, central authority was very, very, very weak compared to the time of Despot Stefan. Yeah, but thank you for your contribution. It was very interesting to compare Yustregale Montanorum, for example, and that Serbian mining code of Despot Stefan Lazarevic. Nobody have done it. Nobody has done it until now, which is very strange. But you just have to, 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 to know that uh, the text of the mining code of Despot Stefan was discovered uh, in the 50s of the 20th century. So maybe... Somebody is going to do that. What I'm saying is a proof that it's necessary to have a, a strong centralized power to, to, what may say, yeah. to organize the mining work. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And which is very interesting. Uh, I just want to tell that when you mentioned Yusrigale Montanorum, it is not, how to say, it is not legal transplant. Since Saxons came in Serbia 50 years or 40 years before, that Jus Regale Montanorum was issued, was enacted. So that is not, uh, it, it wasn't took from Jus Regale Montanorum. And you can see that uh, by, by, by the fact that uh, Jus Regale Montanorum was written by um, um, a lawyer who was uh, taught in Roman law, and he wanted to write it down in terms of Roman law. There is no Roman law in Serbian medieval uh, mining code. Um, yes, let's also, we have another 15 minutes, so let's try to keep uh, questions somewhat short. So I have a question suggestion uh, to Andrea. Um, you listened to my uh, speech yesterday, so I left the Germans. Uh, but uh, in Poland, uh, there was also an immigration of Jews in medieval times. And it was uh, different uh, from the Germans' uh, immigration. Uh, in, and it will be probably good to comparison the dilemma of jurisdiction uh, of the Saxons uh, and the Jews, because the Jews also was a um, special and uh, qualified group in Polish uh, uh, society around 11th century. And the Jews' uh, immigration uh, was uh, in care of the king, uh, of prince, in that time. And they was a servi camera uh, for the uh, prince. And uh, only the prince uh, can judge them and they were on totally uh, the prince uh, care. Uh, even uh, mm, they, all the Jews, uh, see themselves as the uh, slaves of the king. But uh, the king uh, wasn't personally, of course, uh, judging the Jews, but delegated this uh, competence to uh, Polish voyevoda, uh, as who had uh, a traditional. Uh, <clears throat> jurisdiction and voyevoda uh, <coughs> translate or delegate this jurisdiction uh, to the rabbins. So probably uh, the evolution of uh, this uh, Berger uh, court council uh, was because that king uh, wasn't the personally judge the Saxons as a special and very very important group of society in this part. Uh, and because of this, they formed his own uh, court, but in the care of the king. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that certainly, because um, judiciary uh, or, or, or judging was not considered as um, um, imminent to the king's authority medieval, not always. So king was not the supreme judge. But, uh, and, and you can see, for example, um, on example of medieval Serbia, there was, of course, king's court, and king's court um, 
gained some kind of specializ specialization during time. And uh, it is, we could assume, we could presume that, for example, um, at the beginning of the development, King him, himself was judge, personally. But in the 14th century, it is, uh, there, there are testimonies telling that, of course, there were judges judging vice principis in the name of the king. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe a question for Bruno, one of you. Yeah. <laughs> can, uh, can I perhaps shortly ask Andrea another question related to that? Uh, no, but very short. But Andrea, I presume that the Saxons were invited by the Serbian king to do that. Yeah. So this implies also that probably as some privilege they got this, this opportunity. You know, it's, there are similar cases, for example, the Flemish colonists who came to Eastern Germany, they also brought their own uh, law and their own uh, uh, courts and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the question is short, the answer is not. Uh, one suppose, one expects to find some privileges issued to Saxons. They were invited, that's certain. And one expects some charter, some act, anything which is written. But there is, in, in the sources of all kind, there are no, a single word about written privilege given to Saxons. Can be, can be, yeah. It could be customary, customary law, of course. And I personally believe that it was customary. And, but in, in Serbian histori historiography, it is present this uh, logical, although not testimonied, uh, thesis that there was written privilege. <coughs> So, a question for Bruno? Yes, Martin? It's, it's actually more of a remark. Okay, go result, for it. Um, the system that he explains uh, so clearly in his presentation that Bruno explained with the national level and the international level and the subdivisions that report to the international level, and then they reuse those reports and, and that knowledge to do things on the national level. Uh, you can also see it in uh, penal law and civil law in the second part of the 19th century. It's like the, the way things work at that point. Yeah. Universal thing. Yeah, I think that's uh, correct in the sense that this is, just, this is just one example in one field of law, but just it's interesting to see how does juridification works. This is the whole thing about juridification, and I think these kind of organizations, also journals are examples, they are catalysts. They improve, they accelerate juridification because they spread ideas. They, but this is something that's very interesting. You see it in all kinds of fields of law in all kinds of ways. But uh, yeah, this is just one example in one specific field. But of course you can generalize it and get a better understanding of legal development, of transitions, where does it come from? Where they, do they get their inspiration? But that's always difficult to study. But you see, of course, al always national developments are inspired by, by abroad. So you see these many examples of that. This is just one example. Can I follow up as a chair? I'll, um, just wondering um, wh why you think, is there a difference between uh, this area or um, and other areas in the sense that there, after that is then an in, uh, internationalization with the ILO and why didn't that, like, where is it different from the other areas uh, where you see that, that as a movement come up uh, in the ILO? I, I don't think totally understand the question. How do you mean before the First World War and developments? Or well, you the see, after the First World yeah, War, yeah. you have the ILO, mm -hmm. um, and in other areas, mm -hmm. there's less of an internationalization. In other areas, such as, because... Law, as civil and penal law, which he just Well, for example, criminal law, you see also major developments at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. 
with the uh, new, uh, how is it called in English, the social defense with positivism and stuff. So it's another, it depends from which area of law you're talking about. So I, I spoke about this one. You have to, of course, for each, uh, yeah, this was the hot topic at the end of the 19th century. This was the, because of industrialization, industrialization because of the, the problematic that was very clear because of the, the social sciences and, and et cetera. This, these are all explanations, but I can't generalize to all fields of law. It depends from the period and from what you're studying. Yeah. First of all, I would like to say that uh, I discussed this international conference on workplace accidents and uh, uh, social insurances, but they were only one of, of several. For example, there is also the International Organization on uh, Labor Legislation. There is also the um, International Organization on Unemployment. So there were several of these international organizations. And, and um, I think, for example, if you look at the ILO, that, that for example, the International Organization on uh, social uh, legislation that this is more an ancestor of the ILO than workplace accident social insurances but okay but that was not within my topic but still they prepared the way in the sense that they were examples of successful international cooperation so after the first world war when the idea came to have this international labor or organization everybody said oh, okay this is a good idea because of the pre-war experiences so that that's one, one, your first question. Um, so in this sense, there is also a continuity which has not been yet studied in the sense that we talk about the, the First World War, four years, five years as a decisive moment in history. But of course, it's only five years. It's the same people. It's the same episte epistemic communities. So it's, it, I, I didn't study this, but it should be very interesting to just to study who are the people before the war and after the war who are involved in this? I think there is continuity. Not 100%, but still there is continuity. Uh, secondly, and it's, this has to do with the first thing, what is the role of, of the, the socialist in, in, this, in this matter? It's, it's a very interesting question. You find some uh, traces, for example, in the 1889 conference in Paris, there was this uh, Belgian socialist, Van der Velde, who had some... Uh, oh, who had some, uh, some, some talk and... But um, I think actually the, the interesting thing about these this international organizations, about the epistemic part, is that it's a technical matter. It's workplace accidents, statistics, medical things, uh, legal things. It's very technical. And actually, I didn't find that many traces of, of socialists. It seemed to be that, for example, the one that I studied, uh, the International Organization on Workplace Accidents and Social Insurances, was rather a, a bourgeois. Uh, association, uh, very French inspired, but also the others, when you look at them, you don't see many of these. Uh, so that's actually, that's interesting because it, it was from, you know, I, I think it's bourgeois rather than socialist. Hmm. Kind of of representing some kind no, of no. No, actually not. It seems to be more um, the, 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 the one in power, so uh, members of parliament, uh, uh, administrative uh, heads of administrations, uh, um, 
uh, also uh, representatives from companies, from insurance companies, for example. So uh, it's actually a deficit in the sense that it's, the, it's the, the power elite. And that is actually also interesting about epistemic communities. They have uh, an authoritative claim on, on policy relevant knowledge in the sense that they are the ones who procure the, the information to the to the parliament, for example, to make changes. And, and actually, socialists are quite absent in that. So. Development. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing I know, and I think it's at some point it is still valid nowadays, that well, you've presented us a narrative of the pro labor agenda for the pro labor co cause gradually get, getting the upper hand. But there, there was all, always, and there is always an opposition to this. Mm. And I remember well, in one source. Um, for example, it was about the industrial development within the United States, mm -hmm. that the individual states were very reluctant to um, be, take initiative in adopting pro-labor legislation because it always involved costs, and costs always repulsed investments. So they mm -hmm. would, wouldn't you know, like to take initiative so, um, so they could compromise to weaken themselves in terms of competition for investments with other uh, states. So I just wonder whether it was the same, pretty much the same thing, the same motivation was uh, applicable to the international, uh, to the world in general in that period between the sovereign countries. Uh, very interesting, interesting comments and um, early observation questions. Um, as you see in my presentation, there is a big gap between the, my examples of the 1840s, 50s, then these uh, changes in the 1870s, 80s, and then even later on these international organizations. So it's not a coincidence that it takes so long. Why did it not happen in the 1840s or 1850s? Because of, of so much resistance, Belgium is, is a great case. We were actually paradise for capitalists, as uh, Marx uh, once wrote, Belgium. Uh, and that's actually totally true, because uh, always the thing like international competition, we can't have change, we, the, the government can't intervene, it's, it's forbidden, blah, blah, blah. Well, they were, uh, they were able to intervene in, in, in construction works and stuff, but as private labor, uh, labor relations, it was not done. It was the, the liberal dogma, of course. And you're totally right. 19th century is the century of liberal resistance against labor regulation. But you see, at the end of the 19th century, this changes. And actually, this argument like we can't do it because we will have a competitive disadvantage towards uh, 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 com um, uh, countries abroad, this starts to, to, to stop at the end of 19th century. Because, for example, Germany, it, it, it introduces this social legislation um, and they are successful. Also, uh, Great Britain, they introduce uh, limitation of labor, and still they are the leading industrial force. So you see, this argument is, is weakening down. And um, as for Belgium, for example, between 1886 uh, with the Labour Commission and 1914, you see that it's really it's a struggle. It's a constant struggle, but slowly the, the minds open up for the idea of social protection in the sense. But it is a constant struggle. Child labor legislation in Belgium, for example, is 1889. While already in 1840, these, these two physicians, for example, said like there should be child labor regulation, but it takes half a century before it comes. So, of course, you're totally right. I, I told one, I, I told the, the story of progress, but of course, you can also tell a story of failure. But I only had 20 minutes. So. Um, I think our time has passed. I'm sure you'll have time to ask uh, specifically. Um, I would like to thank everybody for their participation, of course, the speakers, most of all. Um, and I think this is it for today. This is the last panel. And if you have questions about tomorrow, I'm sure you can ask Omel. Um, and thank you again.